Hi, I'm Kurt Quitzer, and today I'll be talking about efficient deep learning. And I just want to say that this work that I'll be presenting today is the result of the efforts of many people. So you notice I said deep learning and not more broadly artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and I will describe those in more detail later. Um, the definition of artificial intelligence is, is always evolving. And machine learning, I think you can say generally is a set of data-driven algorithms rooted in statistics. And deep learning is actually, as I show here, a relatively small subset of machine learning approaches. So when we have an ordinary algorithm, we define its behavior entirely deterministically and then express that in an imperative programming language such as C, C++, or Java. When we have a machine learning algorithm, in particular supervised machine learning, we really just define a, a template of behavior. And then we, we actually, the precise behavior of the algorithm becomes defined uh, based on data sets which are used for training. Now, we worked for a number of years, my research group, on applying machine learning. Uh, in particular, we were focused on accelerated machine learning algorithms, and we did that across a variety of problems in computer vision, as well as core machine learning, audio analysis, and multimedia. And we were, frankly, fairly successful uh, publishing a, 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 across a broad of the top venues for those areas. Uh, to get a sense of how that worked, let's look at the problem of image classification. So we're um, in the development of the machine learning algorithm. We might use a whole battery of different handcrafted features, which we will apply to the input image. And then most, we uh, most often used a, a train classifier, such as a support vector machine, to actually classify the image. Uh, we actually, uh, this was not just an example. This is work that we actually did. Um, and we published that in a uh, article, SAS, Fast Support Vector Machine Training Classification on, on Graphics Processors. And it was fairly successful uh, for the problem that it was addressing. And more broadly, we worked across a uh, number of problems in computer vision. We orchestrated quite a number of individual machine learning algorithms here. So I list those here, such as convolution, k-means, mean shift, and so forth. And we also worked on speech recognition, audio analysis, again, using K problems uh, or approaches like K-means, Gaussian mixture modules, and other machine learning methods. Uh, but in 2012, something very significant happened. Uh, what I'm showing on the y-axis here is the top five error rate on a standard uh, image classification benchmark known as ImageNet. And what we see here is a very dramatic uh, reduction in the error rate in a single year. And that was due to a, the use of a deep neural net uh, called AlexNet. Now, uh, I want to contrast then this use of a deep neural net with supervised machine learning. Um, and really in, in the general structure, they're very similar, uh, but at the core of deep neural nets uh, or deep learning is uh, the use of a deep neural net rather than one or more machine learning algorithms. And I described that more in this slide where at the top we see again, uh, kind of what we call a classical machine learning approach to image classification where given an image as input, we extract a bunch of handcrafted features which are predefined features such as histogram and gradients and so forth. And then we pre-trained a classifier, such as support vector machine, to do the classification. Below, what we have is a is a about a nine layer hidden nine uh, hidden layer net, uh, in which we in the first part we actually learn the features. Uh, we don't have any predefined uh, handcrafted features, and at the end we use a trained classifier that's again trained trained on the data. But but there's a kind of a homogeneous approach used throughout this. Uh, in, in the deep neural net. And so what we found when we began to apply that and, and researchers around the world found is that this huge battery of different machine learning algorithms that we had applied to these problems soon became replaced by deep neural nets. And so I illustrate this here across these problems of computer vision, audio analysis, multimedia, and natural language processing. Every one of those problems was not just solved in some vague sense by a deep learning, 
but these these broad sets of problems were solved by oftentimes just a single uh, branch of a variety of neural networks. So today I'll be uh, talking exclusively about deep learning and deep neural nets. And uh, now I'll transition into how one actually applies these in practice. So if you want to use deep neural nets in practice, there's probably nothing simpler than, than uh, just downloading the deep neural net. Uh, what I show here is kind of a hierarchy of methods of using deep learning deep neural nets uh, from, the, from the most straightforward at the bottom to the most sophisticated at the top. So there are a variety of um, uh, deep neural net families that are available for download. Uh, Google's been very gracious in making their mobile net family uh, available. Um, I have a colleague, Song Han at MIT, who's made his uh, family of nets available. Uh, we at Berkeley have developed the Squeeze family of deep neural nets. And over the years, we increasingly collaborate with Facebook, of which the most recent result of that collaboration has been the FBNet V3 family. Um, there are two major repositories that come to mind uh, of deep neural nets. Uh, that's again the model and the, that's been pre-trained. Uh, so there's model zoo as well as papers with code. And then there's also uh, a number of um, powerful frameworks for using these deep neural nets. I think among the most popular are PyTorch and TensorFlow, but there are a variety of others. So with those, um, you can go ahead and say, if you're looking for an object detector that you want to use in, in say, a Walmart, uh, you can go ahead and download, say, a YOLO object detector. Uh, if you look carefully, that pre-trained model, however, may have been trained on German auto data, both trained and tested. And so uh, as one might expect, it works very well on, on identifying uh, cars in uh, auto traffic in, in Germany. And we might expect that it also works pretty well on um, US driving conditions, uh, but we may not be sure that it will meet our needs if we try to apply it to identifying objects in a, in a supermarket. So the next step of progress that people employ when applying deep neural nets is to augment the data set and incrementally train. So we started with a pre-trained model, but we're now going to augment with additional data and incrementally train. And I like this uh, sequence that uh, Andre Karpathy at now at Tesla put together that back when he was a graduate student at Stanford there in the blue, he felt that the bulk of deep neural nets and deep learning was all about developing models and algorithms. And there was a very small uh, amount uh, devoted to data sets. Uh, small importance to data sets. But since he's at Tesla, if you look in the right there, he sees a much larger percentage of data sets and much less in models and algorithms. And in fact, I think he's, uh, as he's expressed on other occasions, he's he's been kind of uh, overstating the power of models here and would put even more emphasis on data sets. So what I show here is a uh, overall structure of kind of the technical, getting more in the technical details of how one applies uh, deep neural nets. And the first here in the upper right is aggregating the training data. And as I go into the technical details here, I have to warn you, this is going to be something of a whirlwind tour where I just briefly uh, touch on particular technical topics that give you pointers for further reading. So as, as I discovered at, uh, at DeepScale uh, startup that I co-founded with my grad student, Forstein Dola, uh, focused on uh, ADAS and autonomous vehicles, um, the quality of deep neural nets entirely depends on the data that they're trained on, and gathering data is relatively easy. So what you see here me is behind beside one of our cars that we use for gathering data. So once you gather that data, then you have to annotate it for it to be useful. And so what I'm showing here is the um, a tool that we developed here at Berkeley for accelerating LiDAR annotation, which is particularly problematic to use. So uh, we use these images to assist annotating LiDAR. Uh, we have a, a one-click annotation approach, and then we use tracking of the objects themselves using previous annotations to predict future one. And using these, we're able to get a, a 6x speed up in annotation. Now, I use this just by way of il illustration. Obviously, um, your needs, say, in a Walmart might, might be very different. Um, but 
uh, if you're doing a lot of data annotation, then certainly tools to improve that or speed up that annotation are really useful. Now, once you annotated your data, you want to get the, the most mileage out of it you can, that is the most utility. And so one of the um, most common, uh, or I would say more than common universal approaches here is what's called data augmentation. And this is simply to take for, for each image, say for example, one flips, rotates, takes various croppings of it, may jitter the color, uh, enhance the edges or do uh, other, uh, other permutative approaches. And an approach that we have exploited in our own research is what we would call a step beyond that, which is domain randomization, uh, in which one essentially takes various levels of the feature pyramid of, of an image and permutes it with various auxiliary domains. So what you see here in A through G are uh, resulting images where we take original source image and we do something more than just randomly change the color, we actually permute it with, with entirely different domains, getting scenes that in some sense seem very unrealistic, but our experience is that that actually improves uh, the classification quality. Even after these, however, if we go back to the original problem that we're trying to solve, we, if we apply these approaches to augmentation, randomization, and so forth, can we, can we then hope that our object detector that, we, that was developed for autonomous driving uh, will work in a supermarket? Uh, probably not. Probably we need even more sophisticated approaches. Uh, so one of this uh, family of approaches is called domain adaptation. And what I'm showing here is the way in which a variety of different domains can be kind of mashed up together to allow you to more easily adapt to new domains, which you haven't seen yet. And what I'm showing, this is a very, very act, active area of research in which we, we frankly, in my group, play a, a role, but a, a minor role given the magnitude of efforts. So what I'm showing you are, are uh, recent, uh, in particular, recent publications, the latest uh, CVPR conference, but some of, the, some of our prior efforts of uh, using domain adaptation, as I mentioned, uh, different augmentation policies for self-supervised learning, and then also efforts in unsupervised learning. These are all techniques that can be applied to get more generalization power. Um, these approaches, I would say in general, have the characteristic that you, uh, particularly the semi-supervised and unsupervised approaches, they require more data and more training, but less uh, time-consuming labels. Now, I, I do have to say that um, as, I, as I look over these approaches, it's a, a significant portion of the uh, computer vision research area is currently working on, on the problem of, of how to generalize to new domains. Uh, there's a lot of mathematical formulas and so forth. There's a, a lot of uh, different approaches being tried, um, but at the end of the day, it's very hard to, to determine if one applies these techniques how much you will be able to adapt to a new, new domain, such as from a roadway to a supermarket. And I think we cannot uh, understate the, the power of uh, pragmatics here. So another uh, tweet from Andre Karpathy says, he actually sees more significant improvements from tr training data distribution search, that is looking at the data splits uh, as you train and over sampling ratios the neural architecture search, the latter is, is so overrated. So what he's emphasizing here is the tremendous power of different uh, techniques, really pragmatic approaches that one uses uh, during training the deep neural net and uh, the importance of curating the data as you do that. So with that, uh, we have talked about ways to augment the, the data set. And now let's discuss the actual training process because we need to incrementally train uh, with, with, that, with that data. In the upper left-hand corner of the slide, I put training in context, and we're now going to talk about rapid training and techniques to accelerate training. Although we're simply doing incremental training, those techniques might not be necessary, but this is a convenient time to talk about training as a whole, because we'll be needing to get into that later. So when we talk about training, we uh, are talking about a, a data set, and we've already talked in general about aggregating data set. Um, when we talk about uh, progress in training, uh, a very standard benchmark for discussing progress in training of deep neural nets for computer vision has been the ImageNet data set because it contains 1.2 million labeled training data. 
And just over the last six years, it was, it was, there's been a lot of progress. And it was just back in 2015 that even Google's Jeff Dean uh, complained this, about the slowness of, of training deep neural nets. Now, over these last six years, essentially it's been one approach which has dramatically improved our ability and uh, uh, reduced the time required to train a deep neural net. And that is distributed training. Um, the algorithm used is synchronous stochastic gradient descent. And in this, at each step of the algorithm, one takes simply a batch or a piece of the overall data, uh, say 1,000 images out of the 1.2 million training set, and computes the gradient updates for all the weights in the deep neural net relative to that, that batch. Now, we see in play here kind of two competing forces. Uh, true to the algorithm, to remain true to the algorithm and what we know about the algorithm, we need to take uh, a relatively smaller uh, batch size uh, in order to retain the accuracy. If we took the entire data set at a time, for example, uh, use the full 1.2 million images in a single iteration, then we know that accuracy would go down. On the other hand, if we're going to use distributed training, we have to keep all those processors busy. So that wants us, wants us to take a bigger batch uh, so that we can have plenty of work for all the processors to do. So what we show in this particular example is kind of compromise where out of those 1.2 million images, we take a batch of size 1000 and, and break that into many batches of size 64 and distribute those across 16 processors. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of the progress here, but I, um, I am proud to say that I think the, this is one area where uh, our research group has had some particular impact. So I show training time in the y-axis and the number of processing element nodes which are used in the training along the x-axis. And I believe we were the first to really show uh, significant progress towards distributing the training of uh, deep neural nets on the image net. And uh, we reduced that time to 10.5 hours uh, back in 2016. And then with that, then a number of commercial groups that had been working internally on, on training probably in fact had superior results, uh, did come, come forward with, with improved results in rapid succession. And we re regained the lead, so to speak, uh, briefly when we bulked up the number of nodes we were able to employ on ImageNet to 2,000 um, using a technique called LARS developed uh, by a student I collaborated with Yang Yu. Um, and then after that, ever since then, it's been commercial groups which have, which have uh, typically had the, the best results on, on training uh, ImageNet, uh, training, say, ResNet 50 on ImageNet. Uh, but we did have another uh, impact uh, with the LAM algorithm uh, which was used in, in collaboration with Google to reduce the training time of the natural language understanding neural net BERT to only 76 minutes. So uh, that's just very lightly on, on the progress in that area. I, I do want to leave you with a kind of caveat regarding uh, progress in deep neural net training. And that is that uh, the stochastic gradient descent algorithm is very sensitive to hyperparameters like initialization, the warm-up period, precise learning rate used, the momentum, the batch size, and the original network architecture. And if you don't get those hyperparameters correct, then you can, you can still see a degradation in accuracy, uh, poor generalizability, uh, even a vulnerability to adversarial attack, and of course, longer training time if you don't get them correct. So, so far, what we've talked about in downloading deep neural net and augmenting the data set and incremental training is a focus on accuracy. And next, I'd like to talk about improving the efficiency, which really gets down to the business of designing and training the deep neural net itself. And as you can see, uh, finding the right deep neural network is very much at the center of our efforts. So what we learned from our experience with SqueezeNet uh, is that there are really two important aspects of deep neural net design. And with SqueezeNet, uh, relative to that breakthrough net AlexNet, uh, we were able to reduce the model size, as you see on the far right, by a factor, a factor of 50x, simply through model design, simply through the way in which we structured uh, the various layers of the deep neural network. 
And then we were further able to reduce the size of that deep neural net model by another a factor 10 through what's various called model compression or optimization. So I'll be talking about both of these aspects. And uh, our general philosophy there was, was not the prevailing notion that bigger is better. Uh, bigger was naturally achieving greater and greater accuracy on the computer vision uh, image classification benchmarks. Uh, but we were interested in going to a counter trend kind of inspired by E.F. Schumacher, that small is beautiful, which is finding just the right sized efforts for the particular applications that we were pursuing. Uh, so smaller neural nets have a, a significant advantage. Uh, oftentimes they, they train faster, although there are some details to be worked out there. Uh, they can result, or most often result in faster inference. They use less energy and they, in, their, in that they use less memory footprint, uh, they also enable over the air updates. So we applied that approach over the ensuing years and up to the present to a variety of problems, first image classification, and then with squeezed at object detection, and then with squeeze seg versions one and two, and now three, uh, various problems in semantic segmentation. And more recently, we, we worked on other problems outside of computer vision and uh, speech recognition, natural language understanding, and text-to-speech. And I'll be, I won't go into those further now because I'll be talking more about those later. Uh, in that process, we got kind of a feeling for the, the palette of, of the artistic palette of a deep neural net architect uh, with different convolution types, uh, uh, spatial convolutions, pointwise convolutions, stepwise convolutions, uh, approaches of channel shuffling. And we, we even invented our own uh, layer type of, of shift. And uh, I got in, then invited in subsequent um, venues to give talks on efficient deep neural net design. Uh, but we should observe that this manual design is both consuming of, of human time as well as computation time, significant computational resources. Now, granted, we were, we were just getting started uh, when we developed SqueezeNet. Uh, but I think uh, Forsindola estimates that he looked at over a thousand different neural net architectures and uh, that all, all together, there was something like 384,000 GPU hours were, were expended. So the natural uh, question here is, can we automate this process? And indeed we can. And I see that as something of a step step higher in the hierarchy of sophistication in, in uh, using uh, deep neural nets and deep learning, which is to apply neural architecture search. So this in a single slide overviews uh, collaborative work that we did with Facebook in neural architecture search. And I'll go through the different elements of this quickly. So first, in any kind of search, uh, there's the definition of the search space over which you will search. And in this case, it's encapsulated in what, what, what was called a stochastic supernet. And what we see on the left hand are, are broad characteristics of a particular supernet. This is done for uh, mobile image classification. Um, so you predefine 22 layers uh, with seven groups. Um, you have base channel sizes of each group are predetermined, and the downsampling schedule um, is defined at first, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Um, and each layer can choose a variation of the template module, which is shown on the right here. And so essentially, you have uh, particular choices there uh, with respect to the elements of the, the different, uh, different convolutional elements and also the, the kernel size and the expansion ratio. Um, to determine the latency of a particular point in, in design space. So again, in design space exploration, the evaluation of the, the quality of a particular point in the space is very important. And we want to move from, from max and model parameters to actual uh, latency values uh, on the, the, the actual target. And so we were uh, essentially characterized individual, each individual layer on the target to get those values. Uh, for, for the latency. And then we just uh, plugged in the results into the, the loss function and optimized as, as before. 
Now, uh, this differential neural architecture search or casting neural architecture search into a differential format, which, which made it amenable to optimization was relative to prior approaches extremely fast. And so using only AGPUs in 24 hours, uh, we were able to get, get our result. We were also able to optimize uh, for the actual uh, latency uh, as opposed to uh, just optimizing max or, or memory size uh, number of model parameters. And it could also uh, be generalized uh, and applied to different problems. And again, I want to uh, reemphasize that this was done in collaboration, uh, close collaboration with Facebook. Um, this is not con this work is not continued with my students, but with another student, with another advisor, uh, Joey Gonzalez at Berkeley. Alvin Wan has continued to develop two more generations of the FBNet family with version two, in which. Um, the channel dimensions were thrown into the op optimization in version uh, three, in which uh, pre-training was used to uh, improve the search efficiency. And uh, I'm not going to th throw a lot of results tables at you, but this is one is interesting because I do think it reflects the state of the art, uh, achieving this very high level of accuracy uh, on the Y dimension with uh, fewer flops than other approaches for mobile nets. Uh, but I do uh, want to leave you with the sense that the challenge in the adoption of neural architecture search is that it requires uh, just as much expertise as the original uh, deep neural net design here. So let me uh, just move this down to show you on, on the right hand where, again, this is one more case where there are many, many uh, parameters to be explored here, and they can be as daunting as doing the original deep neural net design itself. So with that, uh, that's as much as I'll say today about the actual process of designing the deep neural net. But I did want to get back to this, this issue of optimizing the deep neural net. And going back to this uh, diagram, we see it here at the bottom, uh, generally under the heading of efficiently implementing the DNN. So I'd like to start by talking about quantization. So uniform quantization is just a mapping from floating point values to quantized integer values. Uh, so at the top here on the left, we see floating point values, which can take 16 or 32 or bits or, or even more uh, down to eight bits. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we see uh, same floating point 32 values uh, with their corresponding int eight values. And the advantage here is obvious. You're, you're reducing the number of bits required to store the same, say, weight or activation. Now, there, there are many, many things that come from this. Um, what I show on the right here is an is a off-quoted um, graph which describes the relative energy cost of various arithmetic operations, beginning with an 8-bit add, all the way up to a 32-bit 30 DRAM read. And you can see that's a factor of 640. Uh, relatively speaking. So lower precision also means higher throughput. And so these are a little bit idealized values. Um, I should also mention that I've, although I've often talked about uh, embedded applications here, uh, the results that I'm showing are, are relative to uh, NVIDIA Turing GPUs uh, with their N4 tensor cores. And so with the uh, obvious memory reduction on the far right, we actually see also a higher throughput for mathematical operations going up to say a factor of 32 within four. Uh, lower precision means lower latency. And so the speed ups are shown here for batch one and, and batch eight, comparing floating point 32 again to into eight. And you can see factors of, of four to seven there in terms of the actual speed up. Uh, lower position uh, multiply accumulates reduce the energy. And so what I have here are, are data from Marion Verhulst, and what she gives on the left here, the various uh, bits in an integer Mac and the corresponding tops per watt uh, improvements here is as much as say a factor of 10, 10 to 20. And this is presuming that you can um, appropriately size the Mac units for the new uh, bit, bit precision value. And this is essentially another way of, of looking at the same data, uh, but this is from a, a, a later paper, 28 nanometer process uh, with, the, with the tops per watt improving from, again, from five to 10 here. 
So just how do you do that? How do you, how do you implement this mixed precision quantization? So what I show here is in the approach that we've taken is a layer by layer approach, and that's going to be uh, very important. And what we can see here is, is given the number of layers in a network and given the number of bit precision choices, we have uh, very much an exponential search space to consider for each layer, uh, weights and activations, um, what bit precision should we use? So the, I'm just gonna touch briefly on the general approach that we take. And the key insight here is to, what if we better understood the lost landscape associated with the, the function that we're using to optimize the deep neural net? And the way that figures in here is um, as we go layer by layer, we make a simple observation, which is that if the lost landscape is relatively flat, uh, then that means it'll be less sensitive to reductions in bit precision, and therefore we can quantize more aggressively. So that would be an example on the far right there. Uh, but if we look above the more folded uh, lost landscape on the far left, we, uh, we need, will need more uh, bits of precision in order to uh, uh, avoid losing accuracy. So I, I guess I should uh, emphasize here um, of course, it's relatively straightforward to quantize uh, and just change the bit precision of, of a deep neural net implementation. The challenge is to retain the accuracy of the original deep neural net. So we, we have uh, developed the algorithms as well as the corresponding software uh, over, over a series of uh, generations of this work and uh, pre presented that uh, in, in uh, three generations of Hawk papers. Uh, we've also uh, mainly been focusing here on um, uh, the problems associated with computer vision implicitly, uh, but we've applied these same techniques to the large uh, BERT model, uh, where we were able to, uh, among the first, well, we were, were indeed the first to go below 8-bit quantization for quantizing the BERT model. And the, the principles were precisely the same, which is why we were able to, to quantize it so quickly. Uh, we need more bits for sensitive layers and fewer bits for less sensitive layers. Now, uh, as I said, the, we, quantizing is easy, but we, we want to retain accuracy. And the challenge in, in maintaining accuracy is um, that we need to, during the process of quantizing, we, we need a fine tuning process or a retain, retraining process and um, that's computationally time consuming because that involves essentially putting training in the inner loop of the optimization. And also uh, the training data, which you need to retrain the model may not, may in fact not be available either due to privacy or security uh, concerns. And this is uh, in the case of medical data or it's simply made that that data is, is no longer a hand for a variety of, of reasons. So to address uh, this problem, uh, what we did was uh, we used the same basic intuition that we wanted to uh, look at the sensitivity of particular layers uh, to bit precision, but rather than uh, computing the full uh, loss landscape uh, based, based on data, we simply used uh, here uh, in this work, a refined Gaussian uh, as, as the input and use that as a measure of sensitivity. And there we were able to get a, a four to eight X uh, reduction in model size. Now that addressed one of the limitations of quantization. Another uh, limitation is that um, uh, even though you may result in fewer bit precision or lower bit precision for weights and activations, there may still be expensive floating point operations in the quantization process as well as in the uh, actual uh, inference itself. And there are a number of, particularly at the edge, a number of integer only uh, hardware units that is they, they don't actually support floating point at all. So for these approaches that, uh, for these processors, those approaches would be uh, completely inappropriate. So examples of those are the green waves technologies, uh, the, the Cortex M family in ARM, and even the Google uh, TP, edge TPU. So to address that, we have uh, developed a purely integer approach to quantization in which uh, 
all aspects of the quantization as, as well as all aspects of the inference are, are done only in integer. And uh, this was relatively easier to do for computer vision models. So we actually took a more challenging model, the BERT model, and we were able to uh, do that entirely in intate, uh, integer only quantization, getting a speed up of three to four X. And then we also, as it happened, improve the accuracy in the process. Uh, we've also looked at the uh, speech recognition and we have a similar approach that we've applied there, resulting in a model that's 6x smaller and uh, with a very modest 0.25 degradation in the word error rate. And uh, it's, uh, we feel that we've been at this long enough that uh, it's been uh, satisfying to take a step back and not just uh, try to survey our own work, which we've been working on for a number of years, but very broadly survey the work uh, in quantization. And we, we've, uh, uh, that will be showing up in a, um, as an invite book ch chapter in low power computer vision. Uh, and it's currently available in archive. So the last step of the hierarchy here is in which you actually design the deep neural net simultaneously with the neural net accelerator or, or co-design it. And uh, although this hasn't been a, a very much of a focal effort of ours, uh, it has been very educational um, in, in helping us to understand how the neural nets match to hardware. So our first effort here was done in collaboration with Samsung where uh, integrated circuit uh, chip architect uh, from Samsung joined us for a year and he was developing a uh, conventional neural net accelerator to be used as a IP block for mobile systems on a chip. And so we co-designed uh, uh, a net squeeze next uh, together with a squeeze squeeze accelerator. And we, we saw the basically the interactions among the data movement there and how they could be improved. And uh, the results are actually showed he was able to improve accelerator performance on nets like mobile nets uh, V1 by as much as, as, as 6x. We then went on to our own efforts uh, here in which we um, developed another neural net, again, for uh, computer vision applications. And the, uh, we were able to get state-of-the-art results there and uh, superior uh, frame rates, much superior frame rates to those that were available. But to me, the, the most interesting thing is that by using our work in quantization, uh, we were able to get uh, bit quantization down to a level in which we were able to put 1,024 multiply accumulate units on a, on a low-end Silenx CU3 device. Uh, our work following that uh, was more involved in um, uh, less solving general problems like uh, image classification and more uh, very uh, particular problems uh, targeted for FPGA implementation. And so we, we worked on deformable convolutions and formal parts models. And uh, we were able to, to achieve uh, 2x the frame rate of commercial implementation, same accuracy by putting together the neural architecture quantization and developing our own hardware engine. And we've gone on then to do a whole design space exploration, uh, particularly targeted for FPGAs, which again, we're able to get to 2x frames per second with equivalent accuracy on standard problems. But more importantly, we're able to, to explore a very broad range of, of trade-offs of accuracy and um, efficiency. Uh, those are just our own efforts. And as I say, in, in some regards, I, I view them as, as more our own education than ultimately uh, impactful. Um, but uh, there's a tremendous array of commercial efforts out there exploring the same, same problems of how do we better tailor hardware to support neural nets and how do we better tailor neural nets uh, given the target hardware. And so what I show on the, along the y-axis here are the uh, absolute tops. And then along the x-axis, the uh, number of the, basically the thermal design point or the power regime in which they operate, ranging from smartwatches through smart speakers and cameras, smartphones up to independent uh, net uh, edge accelerators. So I really, I don't think we've seen the full impact of these yet, but I think uh, when we do, it's, it's really going to change our whole notion of what's available in the computation at the edge. 
Um, so last, I, I'd like to just wrap up and I've, I've done a lot of kind of discussing uh, kind of uh, individual research contribution, my individual research contribution uh, and how they broadly fit together. But what I'd, what I'd like here to, to wrap up at the end is really talk about, well, what's, what's this going to make possible? And the particular class of problems that I'm looking at most here are the notion of conversational interfaces, uh, because I feel like uh, whether you're wearing something like an Oculus Rift uh, virtual reality, or you've got some futuristic augmented reality uh, device uh, with a heads up display that you're actually wearing uh, like glasses, or whether you're just talking to your, your uh, mobile phone, or, or perhaps you're, you're just trying to make an order at a quick service restaurant. In all of these cases, um, I think what you want is, you, you certainly don't want a keyboard or, or some emulation of it. What you wanna do is just be able to converse freely with the device and have it respond accordingly. So I, I, I mentioned this uh, briefly earlier, um, but this, is, this has been the focus of a lot of our research over the last two years. And in the last two years, we, we put together a flow in which one is able to take voice input and using deep neural nets, uh, then perform speech recognition. So you might get an audio in and output the word sequence, where are the bananas? Um, and then that goes into a natural language understanding, particularly cued for an application in which it, it identifies that the intent here is to find the location of some, of some entity and the entity is bananas. And then in this question answering, it answers um, IL-1. And then given that IL-1, we then have the problem of actually producing then uh, voice output. We don't, we don't wanna again, labor, um, belabor people with having to look at some screen or something. We actually wanna voice output and synthesize IL-1. So with that, I think uh, we can uh, imagine taking the Walmart service kiosk a step further. So rather than just having kind of a, a touch or text interface uh, to pick something up, one can imagine a kiosk in which one is able to just kind of stroll up and ask questions like, where are the bananas? And then given the question, where are the bananas? Uh, this this uh, little kiosk is using entirely local processing without accessing the edge sorry, without accessing the cloud, is able to respond uh, bananas or on IL-1. So that's, that's all possible, uh, but I do have to kind of uh, mention certain caveats. Uh, as I've alluded along the way here, uh, there are continuing problems on gathering, annotating uh, data, as well as trying to use supervised, sorry, uh, su not just supervised, but unsupervised and semi-supervised learning uh, and uh, generalized to new examples. Um, training has come a, a long way with, with massive speed ups, but still uh, typical training will require uh, uh, some um, expertise in, in uh, adjusting the hyperparameter parameters to be successful. And similarly for neural architecture search, we've come a long way from uh, just somewhat randomly pursuing, pursuing the design space in some manual fa fashion uh, through neural architecture search, but that neural architecture search itself has its own hyperparameters to be adjusted. Nevertheless, I, I, I am here to tell you that, that you can climb the hierarchy uh, from uh, downloading deep neural nets through then learning to augment the data set and incrementally train through designing your own deep neural net and training it to using neural architecture search to design that deep neural net, to then optimizing the deep neural net for more efficient implementation, and even getting down into the, the details of the hardware and, and matching the neural net accelerator to the code design of the deep neural net. And we've published broadly over these areas in just the, the last few years. And I do, before I finish here, want to thank the team. Everything I've reported here as a result of a work of a lot of, a lot of smart people. And I want to thank our sponsors who supported those people, our sponsors in the cloud, Alibaba, Google, and Facebook, AI Research, uh, our sponsors at More at the Edge, uh, Facebook, uh, and the Samsung Advances to Technology, and finally applications from uh, both uh, Facebook, uh, including Burger King, and more broadly, the Berkeley Deep Drive Consortium. 
and thank you all for your attention.